This is one of the most dangerous jobs in the world, shipbreaking in Bangladesh. Workers tear these colossal structures apart so that the materials can be reused or resold. That exposes them to spontaneous explosions, falling chunks of steel, and toxic materials. And still, a huge number of ships are dismantled in yards like these once they're out of use. Most vessels that are scrapped originally belong to companies in Europe, East Asia, and Southeast Asia. And 80% of their scrap ends up on these three beaches in Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan. In many cases, illegally. A long chain of greedy actors makes this possible. But how does this chain work? What's in it for the shipping companies? And is there a way out? You may not notice it in your day-to-day -day life, but ships are everywhere. No, really, about 90% of our goods are transported over the waves, and the volume is only set to increase. It doesn't matter whether ships carry containers, oil, or gas tanks. They pretty much are all made of and filled with hazardous materials. Think asbestos, lead, mercury, or PCBs, which very simply speaking are human-created chemicals often found in paint and cable insulation. They were phased out in many places because they can be super toxic and take a long time to break down in the environment. But old vessels can still contain PCBs. So ideally, ships should be recycled in a way that safely contains and disposes of these dangerous materials. For example, on dry docks. Many ports already have them as part of their infrastructure and could repurpose them for recycling. But that's not how things go in Chattogram, Bangladesh. This is the world's number one destination for end-of-life ship parts. In 2022, 443 commercial ships and offshore units were sold for scrap. More than a third of the gross tonnage, which is used to measure a ship's internal volume, ended up in Bangladesh. India and Pakistan were close runners-up. In all three of these destinations, shipbreaking yards mostly use a method called beaching. When you sail a ship full steam onto the sand and then it's broken apart into the, on the beach, that means toxic waste and toxic chemicals are being dumped directly into the water, into the sand. This is Julia Blechner, a senior Bangladesh researcher at Human Rights Watch. There's no way to safely beach a ship and break it apart that is environmentally sustainable or um, safe for workers. The effects spread beyond the yard. The toxic waste seeps into the ocean and affects marine life. It also makes its way into farmers' fields. Close to the Bangladeshi facilities are shops that sell furniture and stoves made from scrapped asbestos. Yeah, asbestos. Exposure to this mineral famously increases the risk of developing some of the most aggressive forms of cancer. The thing is, shipping companies know all about this. The conditions in the yards in Bangladesh, in India and Pakistan is an open secret. Then why do so many of them send their old vessels there? Well, the yards on South Asian beaches pay a lot more money for these oldies than a safer facility. After all, being safe costs money. Fair wages, proper working equipment, disposing of hazardous material in an environmentally friendly way. Shipbreaking yards simply skip out on these costs. That means they have more money to offer for old vessels that they can take apart and whose materials they can sell. It's an incredibly lucrative business in a place with a booming market for scrap steel. Half of the steel used in Bangladesh comes from the yards of Chattogram. And the shipbreaking industry contributes about 2 billion US dollars to the country's economy. So it's in the yard's interest to offer high prices for scrap to attract foreign business. And it's in foreign companies' interest to sell their old vessels for more money than they would get in the EU, for example. It's a simply a matter of profits. Nicola Mulinares works with the NGO Shipbreaking Platform, a coalition of organizations fighting abuses in the shipbreaking industry. For an average size ships, we're looking at a difference, a gap uh, of uh, three, four, five, six million um, dollars. If you ask me, those are peanuts for uh, big uh, corporations, and they do not justify uh, externalizing costs to um, vulnerable communities and the environment. What these richer countries are doing is very much illegal and it breaks multiple international laws. Like the Basel Convention, which stipulates that hazardous waste from EU or OECD countries cannot be transferred to any other countries. So basically, it's meant to stop rich nations from dumping their trash in poorer parts of the world. That includes ships that are ready for recycling. 
Companies can avoid that, though, by not declaring their ships as waste when they leave the port. The European Union has a regulation that goes even further. It requires ships with an EU flag to be recycled at an EU-approved facility, which yards like these are not, of course. But that's where this trick comes in, changing the flag of the ship so the laws don't apply anymore. There's a whole business around private agencies selling their country's flags. And they're usually places that are known for not exactly implementing maritime law. Panama, Liberia, and the Marshall Islands are by far the top three flag registries in the world. But there are also other countries' registries that are especially popular for end-of-life ships. Morris, Palau, St. Lisa Nevis, uh, Tuvalu, um, even a small island uh, located uh, off the coast of Australia that basically almost has as much ships registered under its flag than inhabitants. These end-of-life uh, flags uh, come with a promise of uh, you know, closing eyes uh, in front of uh, violations and breaches of international maritime legislation. This is a way for small states with few revenue streams to make easy money. They lure buyers in with single voyages for demolition and same-day turnarounds. But usually, it's not the shipping companies themselves that jump on these deals. They need to cover their tracks after all. So, before they declare their old vessels a scrap, they pawn them off to middlemen. These so-called cash buyers prepare the ships for an end-of-life voyage to yards where they're not supposed to go. The cash buyer will oftentimes take responsibility for, you know, changing the flag of the ship and changing its name and changing its registered owner. So then, in the last month, it sort of changes into an entirely new ship and is sent into Bangladesh. TW's Asia team obtained a document that shows just that. In this letter of credit to import a ship into Bangladesh, the vessel arrives in the country under the name of MV Hotsi, and it flies the flag of Comoros. But its previous name was Khojish, and it originally had a Maltese flag. At this point, you might be wondering, how can this happen without anyone doing anything to stop it? Simply speaking, the body in charge of setting standards is the UN's International Maritime Organization, or IMO. And authorities and member states must enforce them. As we've seen, that's a massive issue. It is often the case that uh, certain flag states do not have the capacity or the will, the political will, to enforce the standards that have been adopted by the AMO. Marcos Orellana is an independent expert on toxic waste and human rights for the UN. He wrote a whole report on the IMO. Because um, lax registration is a form of business. Registering a vessel means money into the treasury. And there's another problem. The International Maritime Organization has for many years been seen as uh, catering to the interests of the shipping industry. A major point of critique is that countries that make it easy to register for a flag have disproportionate influence over IMO decisions. The organization's spokesperson told us everyone has equal influence since every member state only has one vote. But the NGO Transparency International accuses the IMO of weighting votes differently. It says IMO decisions come into force once enough members representing a certain percentage of tonnage in the sea have agreed. So if you look at this convention, the countries signing onto it need to represent 40% of the world's merchant shipping by gross tonnage. That means that the vote of a country with more ships under its flag, like Panama, holds more weight than that of a country with fewer ships. The decision we just saw happens to deal with ship recycling. The Hong Kong Convention, which will come into force in 2025, was drafted so there would be minimum standards on sustainable shipbreaking. Campaigners worry it would override the Basel Convention, which deals with waste. Remember the one from before that aims to stop rich countries from dumping their trash in poor nations? But activists have slammed the Hong Kong Convention for being weaker. For example, it does not outright prohibit end-of-life ships containing hazardous materials from going to a country that cannot handle that waste in an environmentally friendly way. And critics say if the Hong Kong Convention were to move things forward from the regulations we have now, it would ban or at least discourage the beaching method. Now it does neither. The Hong Kong Convention would essentially greenwash and, and green light those ships onto the beach. OK, we've talked a lot about the role of international shipping companies and regulators. But what about the Bangladeshi government? 
When we covered this topic before, many of you pointed the finger at local authorities. The psyche of the government of Bangladesh is to cater to the needs of the developed countries who are looking for a place where they can dump their toxic vessels. Saida Rizwana Hassan is an environmental attorney from Bangladesh. She has been taking the shipbreaking yards to court since 2003. As a result, there have been several rulings trying to enforce labor and environmental standards. What has happened is, on paper, it now looks much greener. But things have not improved in reality. The standards may be better, but according to Hassan, there is often no legal requirement for national agencies to monitor if the rules are actually being met. For example, to check if the paperwork listing what hazardous materials are on a vessel was forged. The government has appointed some safety agents. They are, in most cases, relatives of the shipwreckers, and they do not have the technical expertise. So when a vessel enters based on a false document, there is no legal obligation on the national level safety agents to dig deeper into issues. There is no denying that Bangladesh has a problem with poor governance on this issue. But what many experts stress is that this poor governance is also fueled by massive demand from foreign companies that actually have the means to recycle their ships elsewhere. And there is an international market for this sort of lies and greenwashing. This is a typical case of toxic colonialism. So when we talk about tackling the problem, we need to put pressure on every single actor. The method to dismantle ships safely already exists. The question is how to eliminate some of the loopholes companies like to use to get out of using it. I actually think this is one of the like areas where there is hope, in part because there's very distinct and clear solutions. For example, in the EU, that would mean applying its ship recycling regulation to the vessel's original owner and not to the flag state. So EU ship owners could not simply change the flag to weasel their way out of the bloc's rules. If the company sells its ship, Human Rights Watch suggests still applying the regulation to the previous owner for another two years. The EU will reevaluate its regulation by spring 2024, and the European Commission told us that the issue of reflagging before dismantling is on its radar. Human Rights Watch also proposes for the EU to implement a return scheme. That would mean having all ships trading in EU waters pay towards a fund, and owners only get this money back if the ship goes to a safe recycling facility when it's out of use. Kind of like the deposit people in Germany need to pay on bottles to incentivize them to return it for recycling. On a more international level, UN Special Rapporteur Ordeana recommends amending the Hong Kong Convention to crack down on beaching and human rights abuses. Finally, to Bangladesh. Here the government has to shut down shipbreaking yards on the beaches. And it will feel more pressure to do so if foreign companies will be forced to stop sending their vessels there. No developed country should be happy with standards that they themselves will not approve in their part of the world. Threatening all of these actors' profits is vital. Because when there's a whole industry around skirting regulations, everyone makes money. The companies who want a higher profit, the cash buyers, the flag agencies, and the yard owners. The people paying the price for this are the ones working on these dangerous facilities or living near them. A reality international companies like to hide by passing the responsibility on to middlemen. This is possibly the darkest page in the shipping industry, uh, but it's uh, yet uh, unknown to most of the people. But the injustice remains visible to people in Bangladesh. So what do you think is the best way to stop these foreign companies from sending their vessels to these shipbreaking yards? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe to our channel.